Matt. So Matt is um, the head of our genetics lab at the Brompton Hospital. Well, I'm, de I'm a deputy. Deputy yeah. head of the lab at <laughs> Brompton. We've also got the head speaking as well, Debbie. Um, and he's going to be talking about variant interpretation for us. I think so, we should go for it. Yeah, Matt. Thank you. Okay, we'll do. I'll just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Uh, not yet. Might just take a moment. Oh, not. sorry. No, that's my fault. You should should be there now. Yeah. Yes, there we go. There I'm we sorry, go. I hadn't pressed a button. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. OK, so um, I'm going to talk to you today about interpreting and classifying genetic variants. Now, this is a very big subject to get through in 20 minutes and my slides are quite busy and there are quite a few slides which I'm going to whip through very quickly or not show at all, but assuming this slide packs available after people can kind of peruse the ones I miss out at their leisure. Um, so a few learning objectives. Recognise why genetic testing is important and why interpretation of variants we find is important and quite a challenge. Learn about some of the key data types and the information used um, that we use to interpret variants and to understand a bit about the importance of applying data correctly. Um, so you'll hear a bit more about the importance of genetics in a few later talks, but this is just a quick slide to show you why we do genetic diagnosis. Essentially, it's to confirm a genetic basis for a disease so you can provide appropriate surveillance and treatment, and it allows testing of other at-risk family members. So this is just an example. Sorry, there's a trolley going past my window. Apologies for the noise. So this is just an example of a family tree where we detected a pathogenic variant in a proband here and this just demonstrates quite how many different people in a family can get tested and are at risk of a variant so testing a person can lead to a huge amount of work in the family and i think our record is a family of about 40 people we've tested anyway so moving on to variant interpretation so the aim of variant interpretation um, essentially is to find a genetic cause for a disease um, and we class genetic variants we find into five classes um, so pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants we're upwards of 90 percent certain that they are causing disease and for likely benign and benign variants we're upwards of 90 percent certain that they're not causing disease and in the middle there's this big um, horrendous thing called a variant of uncertain significance and that's basically something we just don't know if this variant's causing disease or not. There's just not enough ev evidence out there. Um, and then pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants are clinically actionable. These are the things you can do something about in terms of testing other family members and well, potentially providing specific treatments. Um, and this slide, just to give you an idea about the danger of an incorrect classification, so if we get it wrong. So, for example, if we find a variant in this person with, say, long QT syndrome and we tell you it's pathogenic, but actually it's not, um, we might then test a family member, find they don't have that variant, that person gets discharged from care because we said they're not at risk, but actually their disease is caused by something else and they could then later have an adverse cardiac, cardiac effect. Um, which is not good and that that is why it's really critical to get our classifications correct and that is not always easy. Um, so yeah, essentially it's a bit of a forensic investigation with for each variant detected we need to know something about the gene it's in, something about the variant, something about similar variants and um, it's important to have clues from the family so it's good to have a genetic or a family history of disease. We're more likely to find a a pathogenic variant in that kind of family. Um, so first we need to know that the gene we're testing has a good gene disease association. So there's a lot of work curating genes and this, so we always need to have a good evidence-based gene disease association. And the kind of gold standard for doing this is the ClinGen Consortium who have a really good system for doing a really thorough gene curation with a complex sort of scoring system and that investigates the gene disease association and 
we or ClinGen class genes as having definitive, moderate, limited or refuted evidence um, for being a cause of a specific disease disease. So the first thing it's important to do is to test the right genes, which are definitely associated with your disease. Um, we need to know a bit about the variant, what kind of variant it is. I won't labour through this slide, but um, you know whether it's a missense variant that might, might alter the protein structure in some way or a nonsense or frame shift variant which might cause complete loss of function of the gene. We need that's an important piece of information we'll come back to later. Um, and then we need to decide if the variant's ever been seen before. Firstly, in cases with the same or a similar phenotype, and that requires a basically a big comprehensive literature search. And we use numerous databases and things um, to try and find papers or cases or um, studies where we've found this variant or people have found this variant before. It's important to look in your own data. We might have seen variants in other people and we quite often just email other labs asking if they've seen a variant before and that can be a mine of useful information. And then we need to decide if the variant's been found in a general healthy population before and that's obviously very important evidence um, as to whether a variant is causing disease. So we currently use a massive database called NOMAD, which is a big aggregate of lots of NGS um, projects around the world and it currently contains data on about I think it's about 250,000 people now and we essentially use that as a healthy control population but it will contain quite a few people with um, especially late onset or reduced penetrant diseases. Um, so then we need to ask ourselves how common is too common so how often can a variant appear in healthy people before we exclude it as a cause of disease. So just to take a quick example, um, MIPPC3, C1504, CTT, that's the commonest variant known to cause um, genetic HCM. I think it causes about two to two and a half percent of HCM, genetic HCM. It's known to be about 50 percent penetrant and it exists in 13 individuals in the healthy population. And then when we look at the, the age distribution of these healthy people, we can see that um, anyone who carries this in a healthy population is already aged 45 to 50. So you need to ask yourself, is it likely that there are 13 people walking around with a pathogenic variant, but which we know is quite often late onset and we know it's um, around 50% penetrant? And the answer is essentially, oh sorry, uh, is essentially yes. Um, there's a lot of um, stats and calculations that go into this, which I can't go through right now. Um, so once we've found all the cases with the same phenotype that our patient has and we've looked at our healthy population, we need to decide if there's some kind of statistical, statistically significant difference in those two populations. So we'll quite often do something called an odds ratio, which is where we um, find the number of people with a variant in a population with the disease we're looking at and then compare it to a healthy population and we essentially come up with the likelihood or a probability that that variant is associated with disease. Um, just a few caveats here and this is quite a common thing on all my slides, you need to be really careful about using the right data and there's a lot of um, thought that goes into which case control cohort should you use. Is your case cohort big enough to have good statistical power? Did everyone in this group have the same or a consistent phenotype? So it's it's quite a hard thing to get correct. Um, and it's important to know that absent doesn't mean rare. Um, so rare variants are quite common. We've all got lots of variants which only we carry. Um, and that can be wrapped up in this sentence. So allele frequency is strong evidence that something's benign, as in if it's very common in a, in a healthy population, it's very unlikely to cause disease. But it's really weak evidence for pathogenicity. Just because you're the only person with a variant, it doesn't mean it's doing anything bad to you. Um, so our generic approach for this, how common is too common? And this allows us to get rid of our benign and likely benign variants quickly. So we would call a variant benign if it's present in more than 0.1% of the general population for an autosomal dominant disease, bearing in mind things like disease prevalence. So kind of this slide gets rid of hopefully 98% of the variants we find in when we test someone. Um, 
the next things we need to do is see if there's any functional studies of a variant. So has a variant been functionally characterized? Um, and again, we do a big literature search. You quite have to often have to delve into papers. And you need to ask several basic questions about that functional data. So, you know, is a mouse phenotype that somebody's um, expressed your variant in relevant in humans? Does some kind of in vitro cell system represent real biology? So this is, although this functional data is a really good thing to use for variant assessment, it's quite hard to decide if a functional, if a piece of function work is good evidence or not. And we use in silico algorithms, so these basically are computer programs. There's a few of their names you may have heard of. Um, these are essentially based on conservation of a nucleotide or amino acid through evolution, and they use the concept that if an amino acid is conserved throughout evolution, it must be important in some way to the, the way a protein works, and therefore changing it is more likely to be bad. Um, there's a this graph just demonstrates one of the one of the tools just applies a score so the higher the score the more likely um, this computer program thinks this particular variant is damaging in some way to protein function um, you also need to know whether the variants of the type you found in a gene does actually cause disease so there's some genes um, loss of function variants do cause disease some they don't um, I'll come back to this slide later and explain it a bit more. Um, and again, the gene curation activities I mentioned earlier are really useful for this. So um, ClinGen every now and then produce a paper about a specific set of genes and then have gone through um, all the evidence and kind of describe exactly what variants in which gene cause disease. Um, and another good piece of information is what do we know about where the variant lives in a gene? So lots of genes have things what we call mutation hotspots, and they're either functional domains in the gene which have been derived from case control data. So you'll have looked at all the pathogenic variants that cause a specific disease and found out that actually they all cluster in a similar place. And therefore, if you find a new variant in this place, because this is some obviously some kind of functional region, it, that that fact already makes your variant a bit more likely to be pathogenic than if it appears in some kind of other place in the protein. All these hotspots can be functionally derived. So as an example here, um, the FBN1 gene, which uh, variants cause Marfan syndrome, um, this is a structural gene with lots of um, cysteine residues which make disulfide bonds throughout the protein. So if you knock out one of these cysteine residues, you already know it's going to really badly affect the protein function. So the fact that a variant appears in a particular cysteine residue in this gene is really good evidence that it's going to be damaging and a lot better evidence than if a variant appears in some kind of, I don't know, other B loop in the protein, which you know hasn't got some kind of functional role, uh, structural role. Um, and again, as I said, it's really it's good for genetic testing to have a nice family history of disease in the family um, and we can use we can use the fact that other people in a family have got the same disease by doing segregation analysis so for example if we find a pathogenic variant in this proband here and we test his affected dad and his affected brother or her affected brother sorry um, the number of affected people that carry the variant in the family can provide more and more evidence that that variant is actually associated in causing disease. You have to be really careful again with late onset and reduced penetrant disease, which is a lot of the cardiomyopathies. Um, because for fully penetrant early onset diseases, you can test unaffected family members and that's really useful. If you can find a variant in an unaffected family member, you think, well, obviously that's not causing disease. But if that disease is reduced penetrance or late onset, that doesn't follow. That patient just might not have um, shown signs of disease yet. Um, and again, if we find out that a variant's de novo, so it's appeared in a proband at the same time as disease, that's some evidence that that variant's a bit more likely to be pathogenic um, than not. But we need, again, a bit of caution. And it's been worked out that everyone has around 74 de novo single nucleotide variants. Um, 
So just because a variant is de novo, it doesn't necessarily mean it's causing disease. Um, so, as I said, if we know about the gene of variants in, if we know something or even lots about the particular variant, if we know lots about similar variants, and if we have some clues from the family, then we've got enough data to decide if a variant's causing disease or not. And then the next question, how do we combine those data to reach our classification? What's the time? Um, so we use a set of standards, so the ACMG standards for genetic vari uh, for um, sequence variant interpretation. Essentially, this is a kind of framework which puts all of those bits of data that I talked about in a kind of frame and apply and, uh, and gives each piece of evidence um, a, a strength of evidence. So, for example, if a variant is absent in population databases, so has never been seen in health, healthy people, that counts as a moderate piece of evidence that that variant's causing disease. Or if a variant lives in a mutational hotspot that's been defined, again, that's a moderate piece of evidence uh, and so on. Uh, I won't, again, I won't labor. You can go back and have a look at that at your leisure. And then um, once you've gone through all of your bits of evidence in turn, decided if you can apply um, the, the guideline evidence, you then combine all your pieces of evidence and that allows you to assign a pathogenicity. So, for example, if you've got um, two strong pieces of evidence, you can call your variant pathogenic. If you've got three moderate pieces of evidence, you can call your variant lightly pathogenic. Um, if you haven't got any pieces of evidence, then you've got a variant of uncertain significance. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I was going to very quickly whip through um, a specific variant. Have yeah, got... you've got a, a few more minutes, Matt. OK, That's right. I'll probably have to whip through this then. Um, a few other things about the rules we use. They're general, they're not disease specific and they need a lot of refinement. And there's lots of there's lots of gene specific guidelines which are starting to appear. Um, and it's important to know that these sets of guidelines change over time. And that's really important for genetics because there are a lot of genetic reports kicking around where actually the variant assessment that was done is incorrect. And that's because things change over time and we have more evidence. So we quite often get asked, we've reported a variant of uncertain significance a year ago and we get asked, well, is there any more evidence for it? And then we have to go back and redo these things. And that's that's a really important point that things change and there's a lot of genetic results out there that are wrong. They were right at the time, but now they're wrong. Um, so this is a very quick summary of all of the things you do in order to interpret a variant. Check case data, check control data, check functional data, check whether there's other variants in the same region of the gene, check hotspot data, check all your in silico tools, check family data. We often need to do that for four or five variants per sample. In our lab here, we get 200, 250 samples a month. So this is a huge amount of work to do. There is an example of how to go about it for a variant in this slide deck, but obviously I'm already out of time. So it's relatively self-explanatory. It kind of goes through whether our gene is associated with disease, um, things about whether specific variants cause disease. Um, this is the example I said earlier about burden analysis. So people have done work for this specific gene, MYH7, and shown that rare variants um, are very enriched in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is good evidence that, yes, we are really, really sure that missense variants in this gene cause disease. And equally, we know that loss of function um, variants in this particular gene aren't really associated with disease. So this is the sort of thing, if you find a loss of function variant in this gene, because people have done this work, we can dismiss that as a cause of disease really, really quickly without messing around. Um, yeah, so it will go through points about um, population data and slowly adding up different bits of evidence. So it's relatively self-explanatory. And if you want to, you can go through these in your own time. And I think I probably need to stop there and see if there's any quick questions. 
Thank you so much, Matt. Um, yeah, that was a really comprehensive summary and I'm sure was really useful for people to know when we're thinking about genetic testing and how it often doesn't give us a straightforward answer and takes a lot more work than people think to actually get the analysis and the reports done. Um, I think we'll leave questions till the end for the panel discussion.